Welcome back to another edition of the Lockdown Podcast. If you are watching this on YouTube, make sure you smash the like button and, of course, subscribe to the ESPN LA YouTube page. And if you're listening on the audio accompaniment, you can find that on the Sedano and Cap podcast feed. So go to the Sedano and Cap podcast on Google, Spotify, Apple, the ESPN app, the ESPN LA app, wherever you find your podcast. And you can find it there because maybe you're watching on YouTube and then you're like, wait, I don't have time to finish. But you know what? You can listen to the audio accompaniment in your car, on your walk, on your run, whatever you're doing. So make sure you find lockdown wherever you decide to watch or listen to it. So we welcome in today's guest, friend of the I was going to say friend of the program. But the program is not that old. So friend of mine, <laughs> the way I would describe it, is Mo Dakiel former video coordinator for the San Antonio Spurs and the LA Clippers, currently working for The Athletic. Where else are you working? I feel like you work everywhere. Uh, Bleacher Report. I do. Um, sometimes you can find me on the Levitard and Friends Network on the post-game shows when we do those in the playoffs. Uh, yeah, I'm kind of just all over the place. Jay, I'll just be honest, George. Anybody that wants me can probably get me. There you go. Fair <laughs> enough. And that's why you're here, uh, I feel like. But so today, because of your experience as a video coordinator, um, and I know you do great videos on social media, you can follow him uh, at Mo. What? Just give everyone the, I don't want to screw it up. So give everybody your Twitter handle and all that. Yeah, it's Mo Dekeel underscore NBA. So M-O-D-A-K-H-I-L underscore NBA. And you'll find all my stuff, whatever I write, whatever I, I videos. I just put up a new one Mo thing this morning. Uh, I try to do that every week. So Go check those out. And then from there, you can find all the links to YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, all the places. Yeah. And again, Mo, a former video coordinator, puts up the one Mo thing video, which is fantastic. If you want like a deep dive on how the NBA really works, this is a man who's lived and died in that scenario. Okay. Like he has been in those uh, conversations. He's been in those meetings. He's been in there with coaches and GMs and whatnot uh, and lived that life for many, many years. So Let's dive into what we want to talk about today. So I text you today. It was kind of funny because I'm like, hey, I want to talk like styles and fits today. And I was wondering if you could come on. And your response was? I go, um, I'd be happy to, but I don't think I'm anybody to judge somebody's fashion style or fit. Because I was thinking <laughs> George was talking fashion. And I said, oh, I'm the wrong guy. <laughs> yeah. So clearly that was not what I was trying to talk to you about. I wanted to talk about styles and fit on the basketball floor. So that's why we're here. And now you're the right guy for that. Certainly. <laughs> yes. I saw, yeah. and then when I saw that, I said, Oh, okay. Thank God. Yeah. I can do yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> much better, much better in this scenario. Okay. So we're going to pick, how many teams do we have here uh, that I wanted you to pick a couple of teams. You like this, their playing style and their fit on their roster and a couple of teams you didn't like. How many teams do we have and who do we have? I like an even number. So I literally did five for each team. So we okay. have 10 total teams. I don't, we don't have to get to everybody or whatnot, but we can, I got, I got those. And I tried to avoid the most obvious ones, like just out of the way, Boston, Denver, love those fits, Memphis, love the fit. Like right. there's not much, I don't want to try to be that, that easy on that, that okay. department. So who do, who do we have in the like column? I want to start out with, I actually, you want all five or just, yeah, just give me all five real quick. Yeah. So people know Cleveland, okay. Cleveland, Sacramento, okay. Philly, uh -huh. Milwaukee and Orlando. Okay. Ooh, Orlando. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, and then who in the don't like, who do you got? I got Minnesota, Toronto, Atlanta, Houston and the Clippers. Houston and the Clippers. And you know what? If we have some bonus time, I want I would love to get your thoughts on the Lakers situation. Yes. Uh, all right. So let's start with likes. Who are you starting first? Let's start with Cleveland. I just think, you know, from the beginning, this is making the big move for Mitchell. You know, we thought, okay, might take a little bit of time. Right off the bat, he slides right in, fits in perfectly with this team. You know, it's – it's forget just the scoring output, but the concerns were how will Darius Garland and him kind of play off of each other. And I think they do a great job of running offense and running a whole system. And I think, you know, you got to give the, the whole coaching staff credit. You got to give the players credit. I think it's uh, – Coach Bickerstaff's done a phenomenal job screening, moving, keeping everybody kind of involved. And I think that gets buy-in from the players. I think it's just a really impressive, clean fit for everything that they do. And they're even better than I thought they would, George. I thought they'd be like, okay, a five, 
four or five seed figure it out next year they'll really see a jump they've come into play right away well last year they were ranked 20th in offensive rating the cleveland cavaliers this year they're up to 12th so they're in the upper half um an offensive rating of 113.9 um their defense we knew last year was good but to your point it felt like it was a little bit of a slog on offense donovan mitchell you know it's funny because donovan mitchell gets like and, and i get it um ripped i guess for lack of a better phrase yeah. for his defense particularly his last couple of years in utah but i also feel like and you know this because again you were in the league like it, there's a huge burden on some of these guys from a scoring perspective um on a regular basis and the burden he had there was ginormous in my estimation where here it's still a big burden don't get me wrong but because he's got guys who are better fits around him defensively too, like not just offensively that are complimentary, I think they complement him defensively as well. And he has started to slowly but surely, in my opinion, become a better defender, more so like the guy we saw in college at Louisville where he was a pretty good defender. Yeah, like that was the thing. Like the expectation of him coming out of college was he's going to be able to defend at the NBA level. And I think just through the course of the year, through the course of his career in Utah, you saw it slowly start to dip and some of it is the, the, the weight of the offense and, and kind of trying to keep energy alive with that offensive end for everything that he has to do. But I also think some of it was just a vibe, you know, Utah at a, especially last year really was not a good vibes team. And I think there was a lot of that. And I think, you know, you're seeing his defense bump up this year for a couple of reasons. One, he's got several good defenders behind him, not just Rudy Gobert, which, was the case in utah he's got evan mobley jared allen tons of guys that kind of erase mistakes you know isaac okoro is a good defender for them not a good shooter kind of a area they need to fix but still he's got a lot of that but he's his effort has gone up another notch there defensively and the other thing that kind of makes him work perfectly for this team george because not just their offense being a slog last year their end of game offense was terrible now they have a guy at the end of games that's like he can go get us buckets and I think that's a big part of why this whole Cleveland team right now is is killing it. Um, the understatement there was Isaac Okoro is not a great fit. I, they don't have anyone that can play that small forward wing position, it feels like. And they have it's tried amazing. every – including Dean Wade. Not to be confused with D. Wade, who played there, who was number nine at one point late in his career. Uh, different D. Wade, uh, Dean Wade, who hasn't been terrible. But, again, if that's who you're rolling out at the three, not great. It's it, he's not a starter quality guy. They extended him at the start of the season and it made sense. Cause like he actually shoots it really well for them, but he's not a starter a, 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 on a championship level team. You so, know, that's, that's the area they need to fix. How do you feel the fit has worked? Cause look at the beginning, I was kind of like, all right, man, you know, last year, right. Defensively, they look great with Mobley and Allen and whatnot. Um, how has Donovan Mitchell helped them offensively, particularly with those two big men? I think it's just such a threat when he comes off screens, it draws so much defense onto him, right? It's it's almost a gravity conversation that we talk about with Curry. It just pulls in so much that it allows those guys free rolls, opportunities to pick and pop. And, and when they do that and when they get the ball, they're able to kind of not just score, but kick it out to the guy on the, the, the corner, hopefully not Isaac Okoro, but hopefully maybe Darius Garland or something to, to knock down the shot. But I think that's, it opens up so much. The pressure that Mitchell puts on teams defensively when he attacks, it, it, it collapses the defense. And then it's easy stuff. Then it's opportunities where Jared Allen's going to get a couple of dunks just by rolling or just, you know, being in the dunker spot and ready to, to pounce the second that his guy goes to help and Mitchell being a, a willing passer plays dividends for them in that department. And that's why they they're, they're all kind of lifting up. It's, it's a, it's a fun, fun watch really. What do you say to those who feel like Evan Mobley has regressed a little offensively? I think it's kind of silly one. I just, this is for anybody. There are very few guys who have a really good rookie year and don't regress a little bit in the second season in the NBA. He's 19, he's 20, he's 21 years old. This is this is a conversation we see a lot, and we'll get to it with Toronto. These guys take a while, and there's going to be wins where they're going to improve, and there's going to be areas where they're going to step back and eventually lift up. Do you remember the conversation on Jason Tatum's second year? Yeah. Like, the, the regression was massive, the way everybody was talking about it. You thought, like, wow, what a what a, a failure at this point, you know, and, and things like that. And he's gotten so bad, and he's doing all the wrong things. 
this whole thing's a process and just a second year and what's hopefully going to be a long run in the in in the NBA. I'm not worried about it. I think you're going to have moments where they're really going to pick up and get going. All right, Mo. So let's go to the team you don't like now. Um, I, you mentioned Rudy Gobert earlier. Let's just get into it. The Minnesota Timberwolves. <laughs> I feel like this is on everybody's list, but I feel like you have an interesting perspective, obviously, on this stuff. Um, just go. Just go. Just lay uh, it all in one. I, I, I mean, there's the obvious, but go ahead. Just go. Let it rip. It's it's, it's more than just Rudy Gobert. I mean, yeah. r- r- the, the biggest problem right now is D'Angelo Russell. This is a guy that does not fit on this team at all like there's no role for him they really need to turn the ball over to anthony edwards and start working on him as being a, the the main creator and ball handler on this team and then when you have d'angelo russell out there it doesn't help you he doesn't give you anything on defense he's a terrible defender and then on the offensive end you know every now and then he gets going but he just doesn't fit with this squad and i think it's really difficult the lane's extremely clogged for him with rudy gobert out there that's the same issue that edwards had you know when they get cat back you know cat's probably going to be more of a shooter i think than a big man but i think the issues for them across the board is none of this fits they play mcdaniels a ton and 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 the thing is he's a non-shooter so that's the guy that's going to clog the lane so now there's just no space anywhere on this team and i think across the board it's just the roster construction was bad. They gave up so many picks to to get Rudy Gobert. They don't have a pick to attach to D'Angelo Russell to get him out of there. And I think that's an issue there. And that becomes hard in the trade department. They the, they passed on a very simple thing. They could have, I think, made a run at DeJounte Murray for maybe a quarter of the cost it took to get Rudy Gobert. And I think this team would have been much better off. In this instance right now, just everything they have, just doesn't work. And 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 I think they're stunting Anthony Edwards' development at this point. And here's the other part is that I mean, you mentioned the picks, but they gave up players too who were functional yep. players for them. Like Jared Vanderbilt to me is like the like a good role player on a good team. I mean, it not even that. Walker Kessler is a right. guy that's going to make an all rookie team this year. And let me just put it to you this way. Utah is not trading him, not for Rudy Gobert, and that's and 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 that's a massive massive deal. He would be such a huge difference maker on this team for Minnesota with everything that goes. And I'm not trying to trash Rudy; it's just a bad fit for him. It never felt like it was a good going to be a great fit in the first place. And then we just saw it early in the season, Edwards had no lanes to, to dunk. Part of it was he came in out of shape, but. What did it take, like 10, 15 games for him to get his first dunk of the season? Like this is, you know, and he was complaining like, hey, there's there's just no space. And I think that's a massive problem for them. Vanderbilt, solid defensive player. I think a little bit in the McDaniels mold, though, like you could you can talk me out of it a little bit just in terms of he's not being a great shooter, probably wouldn't have been a great fit, but they have they already have McDaniels, so it would have been tough for them. But just the Kessler part at the end of the day, when you when we look back at this trade, we're just going to be like, wow like utah yeah. gave up everything right and and to my point with vanderbilt is you could have used that to get someone else you know what i mean like right. if you would have just done the Dejounte murray deal then you have more maneuverability right as opposed to uh the situation they're in now where they're just kind of like in hell basically i, I mean they're literally you know hamstrung in every which way possible as a franchise and they're a small market franchise to boot yeah, and then the, the then it leads to okay in the off season how do you fix this? And there's only really one answer to how to fix this, and that's you're gonna end up having to trade Carl Anthony Towns to get stuff back because you're not gonna get anything near which well, up for Gobert if you tried to trade Rudy Gobert after the first year. So I think they're really in a a such a difficult position as an organization. Like it's gonna it might be a tough watch right now for a while. Yeah. And they got a coach who wants to play outside in and they gave him a bunch of players who can't shoot from the outside. <laughs> right. Like <laughs> great. And you know th- that's that's the hard that's gotta be the frustrating yeah. part for Coach Fitch. Yeah. He, he he is such an offensive minded genius is the the label he gets. Yeah. And now they gave him like he basically they, they might as well sign me. Yeah. Couldn't be any worse. I can't shoot any better. <laughs> exactly. All right. Let's get back to a team you like. How about the Sacramento Kings? How about lighting the beam here, Mo? Go ahead. I'm on the beam team. I'm on the beam team. It's that simple. I think Sabonis was a perfect fit for them. I think Mike Brown has been a great coach for them. He's brought some of that Golden State offense with him. They're running a lot of DHO, dribble handoff actions, and things like that. And they have a point person in DeMontis Sabonis who's running everything for them. And De'Aaron Fox is phenomenal. Like, I just think 
everything about this team I love. And, and, and Keegan Murray has been awesome. I think, you know, they, they're getting just great minutes across the board. You know, Devion Mitchell comes in off the bench. has been awesome. Kevin Herter, Malik Monk, all of these guys have been phenomenal. This team just works together and the vibe around them. And I'm a big vibes guy because I've been on teams that had terrible vibes. And yeah. when you have to go through that from October to, to, to April, because those teams don't make it to June, yeah. uh, you, you end up feeling it. And this team has such a good energy about them. It's awesome to watch. Yeah, and and here's the thing. I was super skeptical of how it was going to work. Um, And by the way, I'm willing to say I was wrong uh, about the way it worked because I didn't know. I thought to myself, if you're going to trade Tyrese Halliburton for DeMontis Sabonis and you're going to keep, you know, the other guy, like De'Aaron Fox, like that didn't make any sense to me. But you know what? I'm willing to go back and say I was wrong about that. And I'm willing to say, you know what? This is one of those rare trades that I think works for both sides in a big way. Yeah, I think it's one of those things. We also have to be careful how we how quickly we judge a trade, right? And right. I, and 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 it didn't it didn't work last last. By the way, we say year. that coming off the heels of literally just destroying Minnesota. By the way, oh yeah, yeah, for sure. But they but they gave up everything. They literally just said, "Take my house, take my car. We'll just sleep in a tent." It's a whole different deal, right? You know, but no, I this, get it. I get this it. This was Go a ahead. rational trade that made sense for both teams, but it took Sacramento a little more time. You know, to, for it to really show off. And Halliburton's been awesome. It is true. It's a rare win-win trade. And I, I just love the way they're playing. And I think so, a lot of credit's got to go to Mike Brown. Do you move Harrison Barnes if you're them and just say, you know what, let's roll with Keegan Murray? I don't right now. And I think the the unless I'm getting an offer that's really impressive, and, and most importantly, if I'm getting a, a, a rim-protecting big, maybe I do. But it's not something that I'm running to the trade market and, you know, looking like I need this right now. If the right offer comes along, I think you can you can do it. But I don't think it's something I, I would rush at. And I don't want to put the, the young man, Murray, in, in too difficult of a position to start out. Like, it's OK if these guys develop into their role instead of us just throwing them right into the fire. I'm OK with just letting it go and. Barnes has been good and very loyal to this team. You got to reward it. Yeah. Uh, The Sacramento Kings, third in offensive rating, right there with the top three teams. Like, they are not that far off from Boston and Denver at the moment from an offensive rating standpoint. Now, the interesting part to me is defensive rating. Now, defensively, 24th in the NBA. I mean, you mentioned how Mike Brown brought a lot of the Golden State concepts offensively. Where's the Mike Brown defense, though, Mo? Well, you have to have defensive players, George. Like, let's just be <laughs> honest. Like, let's, let's listen. The Monta Sabonis, great on offense. Not very good on defense. You know, De'Aaron De- Fox, great on offense. Eh, on defense. You know, it's, it's, it's your, you have a lot of holes defensively. And I think that's one of those things. That's where they thought Keegan Murray would be able to kind of jump in right away and help on the defensive end. I think that takes time to learn that level, but it's also hard when it's a parade of, of, people driving into the lane and giving up open threes. This is going to be a team that's going to just outscore you right now. The defense is going to have to come in later. And let's just be honest. This is an offensive league. You know, the way the scoring is going in the playoffs, it'll turn into more, more, more defensive focused, but in the regular season, this, this is enough to get them into the playoffs. And let's just be the other thing. If the Kings make the playoffs outright, that's basically winning the championship in Sacramento right now. Like that's <laughs> At least for now. Yes. Yeah, for, for the moment. Like- 16 years? Is it 16 years, I believe? It's, it's 16 years. And after the Mariners made the playoffs in, in MLB, yeah. they, they're they the one that has the longest running sports franchise franchise to have never made it into a postseason play, I believe. So they got to get that off their back right now. So if they make it in there, they can get swept in the first round. The whole season was a success. All right. How far will they be lighting the beam, though? Where where Are they a play-in lighting the beam? Are they a playoff lighting the beam? Are they a first round lighting the beam? Where are they lighting the beam? They're they're they are they're gonna make it outright, in my opinion. They're gonna make it with no playing team. They're gonna be I don't even think I don't think they're gonna get home court advantage. They're fourth right now. I think a couple they'll slide a little bit, but they are a team that's gonna make the playoffs and they're a first round exit. But that beam's gonna light. Okay. All right. Let's go to a team you don't like. Um, let's move on. Where are you going? Toronto, Atlanta. Tell me, where are you going? Let's go with Toronto. Uh, part just because we talked about the second year player and Scotty Barnes, and he's been phenomenal the last few weeks. I think he's really kind of shaken off everybody talking about all the regression, but this team has no offensive structure, George. Like when you watch this team play, play offense, 
it's give the ball to Pascal Siakam. Let's hope we get the double team and and, and kind of create from there. And you know, Fred Van Vliet's hot, awesome. He was hot last night against the Milwaukee Bucks and and kept them in the game. But there are a lot of nights where he's cold. They have no very little three point shooting, and I just think they have a lot of problems. They're doing this whole vision six nine thing that that they're going after, where everybody's going to be the, basically the same player, and it's all versatility. You need a big man. And I think there's just a lot of problems across that board. So I think their offensive structure is bad. I think their roster construction is a bit flawed. I think this whole team right now is just a mess. Um. So look, clearly they're going to make a move, I think. like I And I don't mean it to be a move potentially. And maybe it is. Maybe it's a move to climb the, the standings. But my guess is it's a move to help them build towards whatever that roster construction is going to ultimately end up being. And whether it's Pascal Siakam who could be out there, Fred Van Vliet is obviously a name that's out there. Who do you think is the most likely of those guys to move? And who honestly, from a fit perspective, is the most important guy that they should move to try to get something back? I think the guy they can probably get a ton back for right now is OG Ananobi. Oh, okay. Someone I I didn't even mention. Who also has obviously been rumored as well. Yeah. Yeah, I think he's a guy that will – let me just put it this way. I think every contender is going to start blowing up their phones. You know, it, Masai Ujiri's phone better be charged by the time there. If he makes that, hey, we're putting him on the block. He's a defensive wing player. He can knock down the three. He's he. There are questions of how happy he is in Toronto. There was always like whispers here and there, and they snuff it out, and you never know what's true. But the biggest question is, you know, is he going to be okay just being a 3 and D guy? But he can swing a championship, you know, for a team. And I think if that's the case, you can get a whole lot back. I think you can – I look at a team like Memphis that has a ton of draft equity, a lot of young talent on that team. They find a way to get OG on Anobi. I think that's a team that's going to the finals. And I think that's what everybody's sort of waiting on. You know, Pascal Siakam's great. I just think it's tough to make it fit. His contract's big. It's tough to make that fit in season in a, in a trade deadline deal. Not that it doesn't happen, but it's difficult. I think OG is the, easy, is, is the guy that gets them the most. I think most likely we'll see a small move like Gary Trent Jr. getting moved because they don't want to pay him, you know, when, when he opts out. And I think that's going to be more likely. But OG would be the guy if I were them going like, hey, let's just do it. Let's 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 be bad for a little bit, get a ton back and recalibrate. I think that would be the guy I'd move. How much do you put on nurse for or is it just purely roster construction? No, I put a lot on nurse. On the offensive end, we give Nick Nurse a lot of credit, and rightfully so, on the defensive end. He is a defensive genius. Like, we see it all the time, you know, with the zones he's put out and and things like that. But when you go to just watch what they do offense, there's no structure. There's no system. There's no real understanding of it. Like, you know, there, there are some coaches that just call a ton of plays. There are some that have a system. It doesn't seem like they do anything. And I think that's really one of the problems for me with – with the Raptors offense. And one of the reasons why I just don't like their style. And I think that's holding them back a ton. And, you know, I think you may not have the pieces that you can necessarily say like, Hey, let's just be a one-on-one team, but you need to put something in in place to create the mismatches and the double teams that you want and put defenses in bad position. I don't think nurse has done a good job with that. All right, let's go to a team that you like their fit. The Philadelphia 76ers. Now this is a team that I'm guessing that last year, most people were like, and you probably included, I'm just guessing, were like, hmm, I don't know how this is going to work. It felt like for a long time, even early this season, right, injuries played a part in this, that it felt like James Harden and Joel Embiid were taking turns, particularly in the pick and roll. It didn't even look all that great. But now this team, now granted, maybe the schedule has played in their favor to some extent uh, over the last month or so. But I do feel like this team is starting to hit their stride. And I love, 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 love. I had this conversation with Tim Bontemps the other day. I love their role players, particularly DeAnthony Melton, who I saw play at USC here in L.A. You live here in L.A. as well. I I feel like the roster construction is great. Uh, I am just curious if they can get over their playoff demons. But what do you like the most about Philadelphia? First off, shout out USC. Fight on uh, with DeAnthony Melton. I had to get one in, George. I love the most important thing I love about this is the Tyrese Maxey injury was a blessing and a curse at the same time, you know, I mean, a a curse and a blessing. Yeah. It sucked that he was out. They struggled for quite a bit, but they've stumbled on something. Putting the Anthony Melton into the starting lineup has really fortified this team defensively. You know, last night's Clipper game, I believe it was the 15th consecutive game in which they scored 110 points or more. Their offense is flowing. They're playing incredibly fast. And the biggest thing of all is, 
Maxie called Doc Rivers. This was what they're saying in the broadcast, saying, hey, if you need me to come off the bench, I'm okay with that. Which, by the way, zero surprise, having been around that kid just mm -hmm. a little bit. I was with him uh, during the draft process, him and Anthony Edwards, because I did a feature for ESPN. They were working out together because um, they share an agent. And it, I, I was blown away at how nice that kid is. And then I covered them, obviously, during the playoffs last year in that second round series against Miami. And I like what an incredible kid, what an incredible family, zero surprise that he's willing to do that. Yeah. And it, and it allowed them to actually play a defensive lineup a little bit. It was tough when they started out Maxie and Harden in the starting lineup, because just defensively, there's no defense in the <laughs> from your guards at that point. And that puts a ton of pressure on your front court guys and a guy like Joel Embiid that's got to see the defense come in. I just think they found the the right lineups. They found the right mix. Everybody's rolling pretty good. And just last night's Clipper game, like they had 18 fast break points at the half. You know, they pushed the tempo on them and they really got going. And you were watching guys flying up and down the court. Joel Embiid was running in transition. You know, he missed a dunk in transition from a feed from Harden. I just think the the heart, the the chemistry between those two guys has gotten a lot better as they've gotten more reps together. I just think in general, they got a nice setup. PJ Tucker's always just a solid player for them. He, uh, I, I just think across the board, man, George Niang comes in off the bench, knocks down a couple of threes. The minivan, the, the minivan, minivan, George Niang. Yes. <laughs> they roll. I mean, they're just rolling with everything that they have. I think this is a team that we should keep an eye on, but yes, the playoff demons is, is the thing that's really going to be the biggest question. By the way, the minivan is also one of the best underrated uh, nicknames in the NBA, the minivan, George. <laughs> uh, all right. So look, I, I'm, you've kind of, you surmised that very quickly. And honestly, I cannot counter any of that. Um, I, I feel like they're just rolling at the right time and everything seems to be fitting. Daryl Morey doing another incredible job building a team kind of on the fly in some ways uh, over the last, you know, he had a full off season. I feel like last year where now he really is starting to make things happen. Uh, we'll see how those playoff demons uh, work out, but let's call this a little bit of a halftime. Let's throw in the Lakers here. Now halftime, <laughs> let's throw the Lakers in here at halftime. Where are you on the Lakers? Because I feel like there's a lot of takes. I've ha certainly had plenty of them. They don't always love to hear from me and my takes, but I'm curious to hear from you because I'm just a gas bag. You're a guy who actually uh, was a working employee on an NBA team as a video coordinator. What say you about what you see from the Lakers, how they've gone from the beginning of the season to where they're at now and what you think of them potentially moving forward? So th their style is actually pretty good. Like when I look at this team, like they're, you know, they haven't had, Anthony Davis for a long period of time. The start of the season was terrible. George, I at one point was like, I don't think I could watch this team this year. Like literally, and that's my job. I watch everybody. I've watched a lot of rough basketball. I was like, I don't know if I could stomach watching this team. Started out two and 10. They've gotten a lot better. Everybody started to accept their roles. And the main guy, Russell Westbrook coming off the bench. He's been very good for them off the bench. Just not very good at the end of games, case in point in that Philadelphia game. But uh, I, I, I think the... Most important thing, though, is he's accepted that role and he's trying to thrive in that role. And you know what? You can see it when you go to Laker games. You can see the fans get excited now when Russ checks in They're They're, they're ready to roll with him, whereas at the start of the season, it was very toxic. The problem is the roster is just messed up. They got they don't have any shooting and it's just a problem for them. Like, I don't know how you're going to really fix anything with with that shooting. A ton is put on LeBron's feet right now. I don't know if he's going to be able to withstand the entire season with that when ad comes back do we trust that he's going to be healthy you know i don't i'm not buying the laker team i think this team's you know i won't i i will be impressed if they make the playing tournament like that's where i'm at with them and i know they're not that far out but i just think they have too many problems too many holes defensively too many holes offensively i don't know how they fix it but they have given him really nothing uh, yeah, the roster construction isn't ideal, um, and they need to deal their way out of it. And this notion that they don't want to trade their picks, like, I get it. But here, here's the misnomer, I believe, in regards to their pick situation. Everyone talks about, oh, they only have two picks, 27 and 29. They can't give those up. Yes and no. Those are the only two picks they can trade. <laughs> They're right. going to have a pick in 24 or 25 based on what New Orleans wants to do with said pick. Um, they're going to have a pick in 26. So like they have picks they can make for themselves still. They just can't utilize those picks in a trade at the moment. And, you know, in the off season, they can do that. But I just worry, man, 
Like LeBron has been so freaking vocal during this season from literally day one where he's talking about we don't have any lasers to when he went to Miami and made the comment about it's not in my DNA to play this kind of basketball mm -hmm. to just all the stuff he's done over the last few months. Like I, I look at him and I'm like, God, if they just had like Boyan Bogdanovich, like they'd be so much better um, in a West that's so wide open. Like that's not a huge deal to make in my estimation, but it will cost you those two picks. And here's the thing with a guy like him, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on a fit with him, uh, particularly if Anthony Davis were healthy. Man, like he's got a descending contract. There's not very many of those right. in the NBA. He's got two years left after this year on a descending contract. He's at like 20 and then 19 and then like 18. It is a good thing if you're the Lakers. Yeah, and I think the most the, the, the one thing that causes me to have hesitation, he's 33 years old right now. Okay. Like you're, 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 you're giving up two, I think two first round picks for him is a lot because of his age and everything. And the contract's nice and everything like that. I'll tell you what though. And I'll throw one out there. And this is, this is a bit wild here. I would love to see them find a way to get Pascal Siakam with those picks, whatever it takes. I don't know if that's going to be enough to get Toronto to move, but like, I, I would just say whatever you want from us, you know, apart from AD and LeBron, and we'll throw in the picks, but whatever we can do, I don't think that'll be enough for Toronto, but they need to be aggressive. They need to think that way. They need to start thinking a little bit forward about, Hey, when, what are we going to do when LeBron, you know, is, is, is done. He's, he's not going to be in the league that much longer. I mean, who knows, unless he's going to do the Brady and play till 46, but I think they have to really kind of figure out something there. I don't think Bogdanovich with those two picks is, is something I'm going to work with. I, it helps you this season, maybe even next season, but you're giving up a lot. And I think I want something that I, I want somebody younger than that. I want somebody that's in their 26, 27, you know, age, age range and, and, and really can be something. And that's, that would be the thing. I don't know if they can get it done, but I think that's the, they need to go big game hunting. And I think Bogdanovich is, is just like a duck hunt. Okay. Fair enough. And, and I, I get it. I just don't think they have enough for Siakam. I don't think those two picks are enough. Yeah. Maybe in the off season, if you can add one of the a third pick, then maybe you're starting to get in that conversation. But again, we go back to Minnesota. They screwed everybody by trading all those picks for Rudy Gobert because it completely wrecked the market. Certainly last year, and perhaps even moving forward a little bit. Yeah, I mean they they didn't wreck the the market. They literally just destroyed it completely with a wrecking ball. Like it's not like a flamethrower, whatever you want, or whatever analogy you want to do. But it now has teams thinking like, okay, this I'm not moving this guy unless I get two picks because Rudy Gobert went for that. And I think it comes down to just because the Minnesota Timberwolves made a stupid trade doesn't mean everybody else has to. And I think that's what's going to happen. It'll be very interesting to see how this trade deadline plays out because of that. Okay, uh, let's stick with a team you don't like, and let's stick with the L.A. theme. You mentioned the Clippers. Go ahead, Mo. Let it rip. Their offensive structure kills me, man. It's, I mean, it, how much time do I have, George? Like, that's really the question. All the time you want. Go ahead. It's just, first off, we start with the, you never have Kawhi and Paul George at the same time healthy, and you can't have them for like 15 straight games. That's all Ty Lue's been asking for in post-game press conferences. If you can have those guys together for 15 games. And the problem when you don't have those guys on a regular basis or you can't count on that is it changes everybody else's roles. And, and let's use Marcus Morris, for example. He's a guy when those guys are on the court. He's a ball mover, spot up shooter, really not a lot of one on one stuff. When those guys aren't playing, he needs to get the Clippers 20 something points to just keep them competitive. And that's a night to night role change for him. And that's very difficult for players. You talk to role players in general, they'll tell you the one thing they want more than anything is consistency. They want to know what their role is, they want to know when they're playing, know what time they're subbing in, how many minutes they're getting, and so on. And then they'll go in from their role from there. I think that's one of the major problems for them. Second, when they have these guys, they don't really run an offensive system. Not that different than Toronto, which frustrates me because Ty Lue is such a good coach. When you saw him in Cleveland with LeBron, he ran a ton of great actions for LeBron with Iverson actions and duckins and all sorts of different things in there. You don't see any of that layered stuff with the Clippers. And part of that is because they don't have a ton of practice time because they don't want to overburden these guys. I think they're they just started playing Terrence Mann over the past few weeks, and that's a great sign there, I think. They've botched his development after what he did against Utah two years ago. 
We didn't really hear much from him last season. I felt like that was an important piece for them, considering they don't have any draft picks or, or, or very limited in draft picks because of everything that's going to Oklahoma City. I just think everything about this team frustrates me. Um, what is the solution? Is there a solution in the short term that you could see that can remedy? Because everyone's like, oh, if they're healthy, if they're healthy. It's, I'm starting to think, I'm at the point, and I was one of those guys that love to tout if they get healthy because they have this 74% winning percentage when those two guys play. But we just don't see it enough. So I'm, I'm almost out on them, if not entirely out at this point. Is there a remedy in the short term? Um, obviously health being the most important component, but just beyond that, like, is there anything you see that makes you feel like, oh, this team can make a, can have a surge? Yeah. They need to find a backup center for starters because they only have Zubac at the center position. One thing they should not do is I heard they were rumored and interested in Michael Connolly. Like we need another older player. Like this is we're, we're going to keep bringing in older guards at, at this point. Like you, you, they need to find, energy and and well I, I did hear miles turner as a rumor for them i said i did read that recently yeah that would be an interesting one for them a nice fit he can shoot outside he can kind of spread the floor a little bit for them can him and zubac can trade off in the center position in in you know just the rotations and different lineups and stuff like that gives lou a little more flexibility that would be a nice fit for them i just don't know what what indiana would want for him that they can give him because again they're stuck with no draft equity and that's that's the juice that's what makes a lot of trades happen like i don't think reggie jackson and marcus morris is going to be something that indiana is going to want for that like they got to find a package there and i think they need to kind of make they need to try to make a three for one type trade because they have too many guys yeah and it's muddled the rotation down a bit and they just got to roll with it hey we're just gonna hope Kawhi and paul george are healthy come playoff time and let's just build a team that's going to maximize those two guys if they're healthy. If they're not healthy, we're done. And it's and and it's really the the thing they got to do. They can't try to all right, well let's have something ready in case they're not healthy. You can't live in two timelines. Yeah, that's fair. That is, that is true. Um, you know, unless you're Rick and Morty and you can live in multiple oh, times. Such, I just finished binge watching season five. Great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> wait, to get to see, wait to get to season six. Uh, but anyway, um, all right, let's get back to a team you like, the Milwaukee Bucks. Despite the fact, I believe, 24th in offensive rating this year, um, they, they have played in pretty much only one timeline, which means that Chris Middleton hasn't played very much. Uh, he's only played seven games this season. He's dealing with a lot of injury issues. Uh, dealt with some personal issues as well as his father passed away. But this team, why do you like them right now? This might be a little bit more of recency bias, but I think I really like the way Joe Ingles has looked for them. He had a really good game last night. I think he finished with 15, 8, and 6, or 6 and 8, something like that. But he's doing a great job for them in the half court. Their offense has struggled. There's no question about it. Without Chris Middleton, their half court offense kind of goes downhill quite a bit. But I think when you put together Drew Holiday, Chris Middleton, Joe Ingles, Giannis Antetokounmpo, and Brooke Lopez, I think the half-court offense figures itself out because you have three legitimate ball handlers in Holiday, Middleton, and Ingles, who will be great playmakers and, and, and be able to make some things happen there off the pick and roll, make Giannis's life a little bit easier. So it, it might be recency bias. I know they haven't looked that great. They've dropped a couple of bad games. But I think once they're fully healthy, I think it all fits for them. Because they have a one-man fast break in Giannis that nobody can stop. Their transition game is going to be it's what it is. I like the role players and, you know, Grayson Allen and Pat Connaughton and being able to shoot. I wish they were a little more – they had a little more athleticism on the wings, but they just – it's just – I don't see a way for them to get it. And I think Ingles was a nice pickup for them. I think that's part of the reason why I'm pretty high on them. And seeing Ingles the past few weeks, I feel like he's beginning to get into a flow. If Middleton is not healthy, what are they? They're probably a second-round exit. You know, and I think that's the the what they, they were last year. And I think that's the the challenge. Just because he's so important to them in the half court offense. You know, and Drew Holiday can pick up the slack to a degree, but I don't think uh, he's gonna have a couple of games where he's two for eleven and it's really gonna kill you. And he's sometimes makes some take some really bad shots. I feel like if they don't have Middleton healthy come playoff time, they're really struggling. All right, let's move on to a team. I mean, Milwaukee's great, so we don't have to spend a ton of time yeah. on them. I do think what you you talked about is enlightening because Ingles did play great last night. And little by little, they've done a nice job of integrating him, uh, even though they're not playing him on back-to-backs at the moment. But nonetheless, he's he's a winning-type player, a winning-type role player in my estimation, too. So, all right, let's get to one you don't like, the Atlanta Hawks. I feel like, is this just about the backcourt, or is there more to this? It's their offense. 
it's 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 for me i just find it very uh stuck in mud like there's just no creativity there you have trey young dejounte murray john collins just those three guys there have them play off of each other just run a simple pistol action between the three of those guys that's going to wreck defenses trying to figure out what to do in that sense run elbow game i mean just simple things between just those three guys play off of each other work off of each other and and part of it is nate mcmillan part of it is will trey young actually run these things and that's part of the issue that they have there with with trey young sometimes he just wants the ball in his hand so much and then you put dejounte murray to go stand in the corner that's a gift for defenses yeah. they're not going to guard him they're just going to clog the paint there and they're going to clog the rolls and things like that you know and, and i know they haven't had clint capella healthy you know but they got my other trojan onyeke okongwu and and you know they're they're pretty solid in that situation but they're just not maximizing the guys they have and i don't feel like bogdanovich gets enough uh touches i think he's a guy i don't know what team could do it but if any team could find a way to pry him out of atlanta they're getting a hell of a player oh, if they do he's super ignitable on offense like he's like when he's got it rolling it's like look out it's 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 a problem and i think this is one of those things but they just don't utilize him much i just think my problem with atlanta is their style you yeah. know they actually have yeah. the players it's their style. And, and and part of it is getting Trey Young to buy in, which is proven to be very hard uh, so far in his career. And I think that's going to be an important aspect for Atlanta. If they can just get some more offensive flow and work with each other instead of being, you know, Trey's turn, DeJounte's turn, Trey turn, DeJounte's turn. Because John Collin barely gets a turn in that action when it goes yeah. back and forth like that. And I think he's too good of a player to just waste like that. Do you think they move him ultimately? I, th- I don't think they move him this trade deadline. I just think, again, it's it gets difficult to find really a quick, easy landing spot for him. I know a lot of, yeah, yeah, the money and a lot of teams have interest, but it's it, those types of deals are so hard at the deadline. You know, like Philly Philly and, and, and Brooklyn worked because both Ben Simmons and James Harden made massive amounts of money, so you're able to make the money work. It gets a lot harder when you try. Trust me, I'm on the trade machine every day trying to find (laughs) stuff and trying to find trades and fix teams, and it's just too difficult. Well, the folks at ESPN.com appreciate that. I don't think there's any (laughs) question. All right, we got two more teams, one that uh, you like the style and fit, one you don't like their style and fit. Let's go with the one you like uh, the style and fit. The Orlando Magic, which got a rousing ooh from me. (laughs) I love the fit between Paolo Banchero and Franz Wagner. That's I just love what they're doing. They play off of each other. They actually are doing what I would hope Trey Young and DeJounte Murray would have done. And I think their work off of each other, they have they're rolling with each other. Wagner's one of those guys who, as a second year player, is actually taking a big step forward. I think you're seeing a lot more kind of creativity and trust with the ball in his hands. And the attention Bonchero attracts makes it easier for him. And vice versa. I think you're watching stuff. There was um, I forget who they were playing, but uh, it was Memphis. Bonchero has a 19 point third quarter. V- Wagner steps up and has a 19 point fourth quarter. They almost stole the game. It was one of those fake comeback games, but it was along those lines. though, where they're just playing so well off of each other. I think Jamal Mosley has done a good job as a coach, making sure they work together instead of it kind of just being sort sort of Antigone, uh, uh, uh him versus me type stuff. I think they've just got a good thing going. What about their guard situation though? Okay, that's where it's a mess. Like, yeah, Bill, yeah. You know, that's where it's a mess, right? Like, Cole Anthony, you know, uh, Jalen Suggs hasn't really kind of come through so far. Uh, you know, Markel Fultz has come in and, and healthy and has looked good at t- and, and and really kind of helped to sort of stir the drink a little bit. But I, I, I don't trust it yet. This is a team that could use – this is a team I actually want to see if they can get Scoot Henderson in the draft. I think they get him. Oh, now. my God. Now we're talking about a whole other level of a Orlando Magic team with these two other guys. That, that that's your core right there. Uh, Scoot Henderson is already built like a man at 19 years old. It is insane, and his skill level is out of control. Um, he would be the number one pick in pretty much almost any draft, probably like 95 or 96 percent of drafts. Uh, have you watched him play at all? Or no? Or you? I've watched. I've, I've watched a little bit. Yeah, because um, you were uh, at, he didn't play at showcase, and I know you were there. Yeah. yeah, and that that's where I was really hoping to get a good look for him. But I just think the excitement that he would bring, and I think again his just his yeah. ability to penetrate and get into yeah. the lane and things like that. We saw the explosion he had, the explosive dunk he had the other night. Yeah. Uh, I think you know he would go a long way for this team. Last one, 
the Houston Rockets. You don't like their fit. You don't like their style. They are a bunch of young guys, a collection of young talent, but none of it works, unlike what you just referenced with Orlando and at least their front court. For, let's be honest. It wasn't, you didn't love their backcourt very much, yeah, but yeah. you love the Orlando front court. What, what do you not like about the Houston Rockets? It feels like everybody on that team is a me player. It's my <laughs> turn. I'm taking the shot. I'm dribbling this possession. I'm doing this. It's all me, me, me. And that's a problem. You know, Jabari Smith is not a me player. He needs to play with a we type player. And that's that's the hard thing. I actually think the guy they need what they need to do stylistically is play through Shengun much more. You saw the game he had against the Lakers, but Turkish him, Jokic, let's go. It's it's that simple. Yeah, you know, just kind of create and let let him cook. You know, let him facilitate the offense. He'll try to get these guys. He'll get these guys easy shots and things like that. But there's too much of you know, uh, Jalen Green and and Kevin Porter Jr. all trying to kind of just do their own thing. And it's like, hey, guys, like that's not going to work with this team. The structure isn't there. I think this is a very different team. This is a team we would enjoy watching much more. I don't know if it's a lot more wins, but if they played through Shangun, would have a lot more uh, things going for it. And I think you'd find stuff where you'd get Jabari Smith going a little bit more and more opportunities for him. But these guys get lost in the shuffle when it just turns into, you know, the Jalen Green and, and uh, Porter Jr. show. So one of them's got to go is what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 I wouldn't be against it. It's hard to play that. It's hard to kind of set that style up in, in that situation, especially two young guys that are trying to find their way through the NBA. You know, I would probably have to start just, you know, put a few feelers out, see what's out there at the trade deadline. Yeah, it'll be interesting um, to see how it all works out. I'm curious to see what the deadline is going to, uh, you know, what, what it's going to be because I have zero idea. Usually, like, going into the deadline as I let you go here, I have like at least a decent feeling like, ah, this guy is probably going to go. I got no idea what the hell is going to happen here. It's it's just because so many teams have possibilities of making the play in or, or making the playoffs outright. And then, you know, the teams that really do need to do something, they don't have the assets, you know, like we can talk about it all day. Like Miami's in a tough position. You know, you look at the Lakers, you look at the Clippers, Milwaukee needs to add some athleticism. Don't have any assets or draft picks. Cleveland, they, they gave up a lot for, for for Mitchell, Mitchell as they should but they don't have a t but the, but but now making that next move is always the difficult thing so there's not that many teams that are capable of making a massive move and that's why i would just just i think memphis might be up to something george oh okay look at that look at that a little sneaky move at the end there <laughs> Bo a little sneaky move throwing memphis like a memphis uh you know cocktail out there for no reason I, i'm gonna i'm gonna drink this cocktail i want to know <laughs> what this cocktail tastes you're like a uh, you know, a, a mixologist, uh, you know, providing me something that I have no idea what's in it, but I'm going to try it anyway. Uh, I'm going to succumb to the peer pressure. Mo Dakiel, find him on The Athletic, uh, on Levitard and Friends, on Bleacher Report. Follow him on Twitter as well. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today, Mo. Appreciate it as always. Oh, thank you for having me. And thank All God right. we're not talking fashion. Yes, no, no fashion, just hoops here. Uh, if you like this, smash the like button on YouTube. Uh, subscribe to the ESPN LA YouTube page. And if you want the audio accompaniment, go to Sedano and Cap, our talk show on ESPN LA. You will find Lockdown there in that particular podcast. It will be within the podcast as we break down the different hours of Sedano and Cap. Lockdown will be there as a separate hour as well. Mo, thanks again. We'll talk to you soon. Yep. All right. Thank you, guys. And we will talk to you the next time on Lockdown.